we continue Aleister Crowley's The Diary of a Drug Fiend. We are in Chapter 4, Below the Brutes. There was nothing for Basil to do but to go. Peter pretended to have scored a triumph. It would not have deceived anybody, but if there had been a chance, he cut away the pulpit from under his own feet when he swung back into the room and snapped with genuine feeling. What a fool I am! Why didn't you tip me the wink? We ought to have played up to him and got some heroin out of him. And this isn't book two, Inferno. Um, this morning has taken everything out of me. I don't care about saving myself. I know I can't save Peter. Why must a woman always have a man for her motive? All I want is H. Both Cocky and I need it hellishly. Look here, Lou, he said with a cunning grin, such as I'd never seen before. Quite out of keeping with the doctors, a man told me last night that there were some who would give you a prescription if you paid them enough. A tenor ought to do the trick. He pulled some dirty, crumpled notes out of his trousers pocket. Here you are, for God's sake. Don't be long. I was as keen as he was. All the will to stop had been washed out of me when Basil went. My self-respect was annihilated. Yet, I think it was reluctance to go that kept me hanging about on the pretense of attending to my toilet. Peter watched me with approval. There was a hateful gleam in his eye, and I loved it. We were both degraded, though, through and through. We had reached the foul straw of the sty. There was something warm and comfortable about snuggling up to depravity. We had realized the ideal of our perversion. I went to my own doctor. Peter had put me up to symptoms, but he wasn't taking any. He talked about change of climate and diet, and the mixture to be taken three times a day. I saw at once it was no good by the way he jumped when I mentioned heroin first. All I could do was to get out at the old fool's room without losing face. I didn't know what to do next. I felt like Morris. What's his name? In the wrong box when he had to have a false death certificate and wanted a female doctor. It annoyed me that it was daylight, and I didn't know where to go. Suddenly, out of nowhere, there came the name and address of the man who had helped Billy Coleridge out of her scrape. It was a long way off, and I was horribly tired. I was hungry, but the thought of lunch made me sick. I felt that people were looking at me strangely. Was it the scar by my eye? I bought a thick veil. The girl looked surprised, I thought. I suppose it was rather funny in September, and might attract still more attention. But it gave me a sense of protection, and it was a very pretty veil. Cream lace, with embroidered zigzags. I took a taxi to the doctor's. Dr. Collins, it was. 61 or 71. Fairblank Street, Lambeth. I found him at home, a horrid, snuffy old man with shabby clothes, a dingy, grimy office, as untidy as himself. He seemed disappointed at my story. It wasn't his line, he said, and he didn't want to get into any trouble. 
On the other hand, he was frightened of me because of what I knew about Billy. He promised to do what he could, but under the new law he couldn't do more than prescribe ten doses of an eighth of a grain apiece. Four or five sniffs, the whole thing. And he wouldn't dare to repeat it in less than a week. However, it was better than nothing. He told me where to get it made up. I found a cloakroom where I could put the packets into one and started. Now, what, what's that dosed wise? Um, is a grain a forty eighth of a gram? So that that's that's quite a bit compared to what people use nowadays. Um, I found a cloakroom where I could put the packets into one, and I started. The relief was immense. I went on, dose after dose. Cocky could get his own. I should tell him I had drawn blanks. I felt I could eat again, and had some light food, and a couple of whiskeys and sodas. I felt so good that I drove straight back to Greek Street and poured out a mournful tale of failure. It was delicious to deceive that brute after he'd struck me. Now, what I meant earlier is that nowadays your typical is, you know, two or three milligrams per five dollars. So, yeah. It was keen pleasure to see him in such pain, to imitate his symptoms with minute mimicry, to mock at his misery. He was angry all the same, but his blows gave me infinite pleasure. They were the symbols of my triumph. Here, you get out of this, he said, and don't come back without it. I know where you can get it. Andrew McCall is the man's name. I know him to the bottom of his rotten soul. He gave me the address. It was a magnificent house near Sloan Square. He had married a rich old woman and lived on the fat of the land. I had met him once myself in society. He was a self-made Scot, and thought everything uh, thought evening dress, de rigueur, in paradise. Peter sent me off with a sly snicker. There was some insane idea at the back of his mind. Well, what did I care? I presume that's like a, you know, a snicker, basically. Um, Dr. McCall was a man of 50 or so, very well preserved and very well dressed, with a gardenia in his buttonhole. He recognized me at once and drew me by the hand into a comfortable armchair. He began to chatter about our previous meeting about the Duchess of this and the Countess of the and the Countess of that. I wasn't listening, I was watching. His tact told him that I wasn't interested. He stopped abruptly. Well well, excuse me for the running on like this about old times. The point is, what can I do for you today, Miss Lalaham? I instantly saw my advantage. I shook my head laughingly. Oh no, I said. It's not Miss Allaham. He begged my pardon profusely for the mistake. Can it be possible? Two such beautiful girls, so much alike. No, I smiled back. It's not as bad as that. I was Miss Allaham, but now I am Lady Pendragon. I think that's supposed to be pronounced Laylaham, but, um, dear, dear, he said, where can I have been? Quite out of the world, quite out of the world. Oh, I'm not quite such an important person as that, and I only married Sir Peter in July. Ah, that accounts for it, said the doctor. I've been away all the summer in the heather with the 
Martianus of Aig. Quite out of the world. Quite out of the world. Well, I'm sure you're very happy, my dear Lady Pendragon. He always mentioned a title with a nose, uh, with a noise, like a child, sucking a stick of barley sugar. I saw at once the way to appeal him. Well, of course, you know, I said. In really smart sucrals, one has to offer heroin and cocaine to people. It's only a passing fashion, of course, but while it's on, one's really out of it if one doesn't do the right thing. Mr. Call got out of the chair at his desk and drew up a little tape stride stool close to mine. I see, I see, he muttered, confidentially, taking my hand and beginning to stroke it gently. But you know, it's very hard to get. It is for us poor outsiders, I lamented, but not for you. He rolled back my sleeve and moved his hand up and down inside of my forearm. I resented the familiarity acutely. The snobbishness of the man reminded me that he was the son of a small shopkeeper in a lowland village, a fact which I shouldn't have thought of for a second, but for his own unctuous insistence on Deborah. He got up and went to a little wall safe behind my back. I could hear him open and shut it. He returned and leant over the back of my chair, striking out his left arm so that I could see what is in his hand. It was a sealed ten-gram bottle labored heroin hydrochloride well, I guess different spelling hey, heroin hydrochloride with the quanti uh, <coughs> heroin hydrochloride with the quantity and maker's name the sight of it drove me almost insane with desire. Within a yard of my face was the symbol of victory. Cocky, basil, the law, my own physical pangs, they were all in my power from the moment my fingers closed over the bottle. I put out my hand, but the heroine had disappeared in the manner of a conjuring trick. McCall linked his weight on the back of my chair, and tilted it slightly. His ugly, shrewd, false face was within a foot of mine. Will you really let me have that? I faltered. Sir Peter's very rich. We can afford to pay the price, whatever it is. He gave a funny little laugh. I shrank from the long, wolf-like mouth hanging over me, greedily open with its bared two white rows of sharp, long fangs. I was nauseated by the stale whiskey in his breath. He understood immediately, let my chair back to its normal position, and went back to his desk. He sat there and watched me eagerly like a man, stalking game, as if inadvertently he took out the bottle and played with it aimlessly. In his smooth, varnished voice, he began to tell me what he called the romance of his life. The first time he saw me, he had fallen passionately in love with me. But he was a married man, and his sense of honor prevented his yielding to his passion. He had, of course, no love for his wife, who didn't understand him at all. He had married her out of pity. But for all that he was bound by his sense of right feeling, and above all by realizing that to give rein to his passion, God-given though it was, would mean social ruin for me, for the woman he loved. He went on to talk about affinities and soulmates and love at first sight. He reproached himself for having told me the truth, even now. But it had been too strong for him, the irony of fate. 
the tragic absurdity of social restrictions. At the same time, he would feel a certain secret pleasure if he knew that I, on my part, had something of the same feeling for him. And all the time, he went on, he went on playing with the heroine. Once or twice, he nearly dropped it in his nervous emotion. It made me jump to think of the danger to that precious powder. But there was clearly only one thing to be done to get it, to fall in with the old fellow's humor. I let my hand fall on my breast and looked at him sideways out of the corners of my eyes. You can't expect a young girl to confess everything she has felt, I whispered with a deep sigh, especially when she has had to kill it out of her heart. It does no good to talk of these things, I went on. I ought really not to have come. But how I could guess that you, a great doctor like you, had taken any notice of a silly kid like me. He jumped to his feet excitedly. No, no, I said sadly, with a gesture which made him sit down again very uneasily. I should never have come. It was absolutely weakness on my part. The heroine was only my excuse. Oh, don't make me feel so ashamed. But I simply must tell you the truth. The real motive was that I wanted to see you. Now let's talk about something else. Will you let me have that heroine? And how much will it cost? One doesn't charge one's friends for such slight services, he answered loftily. The only doubt in my mind is whether it's right for me to let you have it. He took it out again and read the label. He rolled the bottle between his palms. It's terribly dangerous stuff, he continued very seriously. I'm not at all sure if I should be justified in giving it to you. What absolute rubbish and waste of time. This social comedy. Everyone in London knew McCall's hobby for intrigues with ladies of title. He had invented the silly story of love at first sight on the spur of the moment. It was just a gambit. And as for me, I loathed the sight of the man, and he knew it. And he knew, too, that I wanted that heroine desperately, badly. The real nature of the transaction was as plain as a prison plum pudding. But, I suppose, it does amuse one in a sort of way to ape various affected attitudes. He knew that my modesty and confusion and blushes were put on like so much paint on the cheeks of a Piccadilly streetwalker. It didn't even hurt his vanity to know that I thought him an offensive old ogre. He had the thing I wanted. I had the thing he wanted. And he didn't care if I drugged myself to death tomorrow, provided I'd paid his price today. The callous cynicism on both sides had one good effect from the moral point of view. It prevented me wasting my time in trying to cheat him. He went on with his gambit. He explained that my marriage made a great difference with reasonable caution, for which we had every felicity. There was not the slightest risk of scandal. Only one thing stuck in my conscience and fought the corrosive attack on the heroin hunger after King Lemus had gone this morning, Peter and I had quarreled bitterly. I had given up Basil. I had given up all idea of living a decent life. I had embraced the monster in whose arms I was struggling, gone with my eyes wide open into his dungeon, devoted myself to drugs, and why? I was Sir Peter's wife. The loss of my virtue, independence, self-respect were demanded by my loyalty to him, and already that loyalty demanded disloyalty of another kind. It was a filthy paradox, 
Peter had sent me to Mr. McCall with perfect foresight, I knew well enough what he expected of me, and I gloried in my infamy, partly for its own sake, but partly unless I am lying to myself, because my degradation proved my devotion to him. I no longer heard what Mr. Call was saying, but I saw that he had taken a little pocket knife and cut the string of the bottle. He had levered out the cork and dipped the knife into the powder. He measured out a dose with a queer, cunning, questioning smile in his eyes. My breath was coming quickly and shallowly. I gave a hurried little nod. I seemed to hear myself saying, A little bit more. At least, he added to the heap. A little mild stimulant is indicated, he said, with an imitation of his bedside manner. He was kneeling in front of my chair and held up his hand like a priest, making an offering to his goddess. The next thing I remember is that I was walking feverishly, almost running, up Sland Street, I had a feeling of being pursued. Was it true, that old Greek fable of the Furies? What had I done? What had I done? My fingers worked spasmodically on the little amber-tinted bottle of poison. I wanted to get away from everyone and everything. I didn't know where I was going. I hated Peter from the depths of my soul. I would have given anything in the world except the heroine, to be able never to see him again. But he had the money. Why shouldn't we enjoy our abject ruin as we had enjoyed our romance? Why not wallow in the moist, warm mire? And especially when people convince themselves they're doing wrong by it, um, and realize that extent, they're like, well, I can let other things in, and other things in, and other things in, and risks involved, and all that. 